Welcome, everyone. Hope that my Wi Fi is good. All right. Hello. Love you all very much. Okay. So, welcome, everybody. I'm going to get started. So, Bizrat Hashem, tonight we're going to do a Torah class about this week's Parsha, Parsha's Noah which is very correlated to everything that's going on this week in the world. And we're going to correlate everything. We're going to read from the Torah itself. And we're going to connect it to everything that's going on and hopefully give us strength and give us courage and give us more emunah, more faith. There's a lot of deep stuff that I want to cover. There's a lot that I want to cover. So I hope to be able to get through most of it. And yeah, so take a deep breath, let go of all of the things that we're holding on to from this week and be able to enter into the SOAR class with a greater consciousness and a greater perspective. All right, so I want to dedicate the class first, the sponsor, a beautiful woman dedicated to her children, for Chana Bat Amalia and Yaakov Ben Amalia. May they give you much nachat when they have good health and live a long and happy, happy life. All right, and it's dedicated to everybody in Eretz Yisrael. May all of Klal Yisrael be protected. May everybody have emuna and bitachon and koach to get through this harsh thing that we're all going through. And Bezrat Hashem, have the koach to all persevere. And may everybody be protected in Am Yisrael. And may we persevere, Bezrat Hashem. All right. Hashem svatay tiftach ufi agid teilatecha. All right, so let's begin. So I'm going to cover the basics of Parsha's Noach. I'm going to go through the pshat, the basic understanding of it, go quickly through the story, and then we're going to go very deep in the whole thing. Okay, it's going to be really exciting. So basically, Noach, this week's Parsha. Hashem tells us that there have been 10 generations from Adam to Noach. And within those 10 generations, the entire world got incredibly, insanely corrupt. It got incredibly immoral, incredibly violent and hateful. I don't know if to turn off comments, they're so distracting. Anyway, <laughs> 10 generations from Adam to Noah, and everybody in that generation got insanely corrupt and insanely evil. It says in the Torah that the evil within man just got too great. It got too big that everybody became extremely immoral. It says specifically in Hebrew that that the entire world was filled with Hamas. Now we're going to take out the terrorist organization for a second. Hamas is a Hebrew word. It means violence. It means robbery. Hashem tells us that the entire world was filled with Hamas. It was filled with this violence and immorality and robbery and adultery and all of the evil things that humans can get to, that was what all of society had sunken into. And God tells us that because the world is filled with Hamas, that he is going to destroy it. That God's limit of mercy and of patience with humanity was just, that's it. He was done with it. He couldn't take it anymore. And he wanted to destroy all of humanity because he couldn't take their corruption anymore. All right. No aggressive comments. By the way, this is dedicated for more light in the world. So if you're not for that, then leave. Okay, thank you. No aggressive comments, please. Yeah, should we take off comments? Let's take off comments. Too distracting for myself. Okay, welcome everyone. Okay, so the entire world got insanely corrupt and Hashem says that since it was filled with Hamas, it was filled with violence and immorality, he destroyed the entire world. Okay, that's the basics. And the Torah tells us that Hashem saw one person in the entire world, and that was Noah. And he said, Noah, I want to destroy the entire world because humanity's level of corruption and evil has gotten too far. 
and there's no return from it. But Noah, I see you as righteous. Noah ish tzaddik b'toratam. Noah was a righteous man in his generation, the Torah tells us. Hashem saw goodness in Noah, and he sought to save humanity through him. So God goes and tells Noah, Noah, I'm going to save you because you have found favor in my eyes. In 120 years time, I'm going to bring a giant flood over the entire world, like nobody has ever has seen before. And it's going to wipe out all of life, all of humanity, all animals, everything is going to be wiped out. I'm giving you 120 years to build an ark this big, this wide. And when the flood comes in this ark, I want you to shelter yourself and I will make sure you are protected inside of this ark. And he tells them that your wife can go in the ark and your children can go in the ark. And I want you to get specific animals to put in the ark. And with you, humanity will keep on going. But the way that humanity has been thus far, it can't be any longer. It must all be destroyed. And so what happens? 120 years pass. A huge flood comes to the world because humanity has not changed their ways. Humanity was insanely evil got to them. And a huge flood comes and it wipes out everybody. Noah is in the ark, 40 days and 40 nights of pure rain, insane rain, and then 150 days of waiting for the waters to go down. Noah sends out a bird. Once the waters stop, he hears it, and he sends out a bird to go see if he could walk on dry land already. When he sends a bird and the bird comes back with an olive branch, he sees that the waters has gone down and he's able to go and be on land. So he makes it to land and he gets off of the land. And we're told that the first thing he does is he brings a sacrifice to God. And then the next thing immediately that he does is he plants a vineyard. He gets grapes. He makes wine and he gets very drunk. That's the first thing that he does. He gets insanely drunk and he gets so drunk that he gets naked. Now, Noah has three sons. Those three sons are Shem. Cham and Yafet, right? We're told that when Noah got so drunk to such an extent, his one of his sons, Cham, saw his father's drunkenness and decided to make fun of him. And he started mocking him. And we're told from some commentaries that he sexually abused him and that he just made a mockery out of his father's drunkenness and nakedness. And then Ham went to go and tell his other two brothers about how much of an idiot his father was. And Shem and Yafet told Ham, what are you doing? You're making a disgrace out of your father. We're told that Shem and, and Yafet, guided by Shem, covered their eyes and went and covered their father's nakedness. And they put him in a safe place and waited for him to wake up. When Noah woke up, he woke up and he saw and he remembered slightly what had happened. And he immediately curses Ham for what he did, and he blesses Shem, and he gives a different blessing to Yafet, okay? And then Noah starts his life, and that's the basics of the story. But now we're going to go in depth, Bezret Hashem. So it says, first thing, that this the world was filled with Hamas. Now, what is Hamas, okay? Take out the terrorist organization. Hamas is a klipa. It is a negative energy source, which means violence. And God literally tells us that he wiped out existence because of Hamas. So what does it really mean? So we see that Hamas, the, the word in Hebrew, this is Hamas, which means on a literal level, violence and robbery. It roots from the same word as Ham. Ham, remember, is... Noah's son, who mocked his father and sexually abused his father when he was drunk and naked, it comes from the same root. Cham literally means heat. Cham means heat because the sun in Hebrew could either mean Shemesh, or it could also mean Chama because it's, it's hot, it's heat. So Cham means heat. But how did Cham? channel this heat that is embedded within him he channeled it negatively into negative sexual impurity you see Hamas the root of it is sexual immorality 
because it roots from the same word as Ham, and Ham sexually abused his father. It is this fiery passion for sexual immorality, and it is robbery. And it's because of this that God could not tolerate the evil of humanity more, and he destroyed all of humanity because of Hamas. What is the klipa of Hamas? It is sexual immorality, and it is stealing. That is where God reached his peak. He said, do everything else, but you do this, and I cannot take this anymore. People were adulterous. People were raping women. People were aggressive. And I'm speaking about the times of Noah. And God said, I've had it up to here. You're all being destroyed. Now, you could correlate it to what the terrorist organization of Hamas has done, which is literally sexually aggressively abuse women, because remember, the literal meeting of Hamas is violence. But the deeper klipa, negative energy that it is, is sexual immorality, sexual abuse, because that's what Ham did, and that's where Hamas comes from. It's a huge chidush. It's sexual immorality, and it is robbery. And what did Hamas do? It sexually aggressively abused women, and it stole hostages. And that's what Hamas does. And that's where God said, I've had it up to here. I cannot take it anymore. And make no mistake that it is by no coincidence that in the exact same week that Hamas attacks, it's in this week's Parsha. Nothing is by coincidence. God has given us a clear message. Now, the question is, how do we fight this evil klipa of Hamas? Right? If the klipa, the negative energy, is sexual immorality and it is robbery, how do we fight it? By taking away all the sexually immoral things in our life. You know, they say that the generation of Noah, which was the most corrupt and degenerate generation, is compared to the last generation, which is our generation right now. Our sages compare our generation to their generation. You see, what's the biggest problem in our generation, the most corrupt thing in our generation? It's how everything is sexualized. Absolutely everything. They try to sexualize things on children. They try to sexualize in any single crevice of our existence. That's what the evil people of this world are trying to do. Because it is what God detests the most. If there's something that God hates, it is sexual immorality. Where are the Jewish people? What do we stand for? We are Am Kadosh. We are the holy people. Because that is what God loves and that is what God wants in the world. We stand for a family unit. We stand for marriage. We stand for values. How do you want to practically fight the negative energy of Hamas? Ask yourself how you can bring more sexual purity into your life. And everybody can bring it into their own way, right? I don't want to get into the details. Everybody knows different ways that they can start guarding themselves more. You know, be careful with what you watch. Be careful with what you read. You know, woman, it's been very accepted for a woman to read these novels that are completely inappropriate. It is completely sexually corrupting your mind. If you're a girl and you read these romance novels, throw them out. You're giving life, you're giving energy to the negative forces when you read these things. And whatever you're watching, whatever you're doing, if you're married, you could start keeping the laws of Nida, the laws of Tahara Tamishpacha, which is the laws of family purity. Ask yourself, can you start guarding your eyes more against seeing the impure things in this world so you don't start triggering immoral thoughts in your mind? When we take a step forward in guarding our morality, in guarding sexual purity and stop being so promiscuous how this generation is, we defeat the negative spiritual energy that is Hamas, which is sexual immorality. Okay, so that's number one that we learned from this week's Parsha. How do we want to fight Hamas? Start guarding yourself with sexual purity. It's incredibly important because immorality is what God hates most. Adultery, rape, all of these things God detests. Okay, and that's why he destroyed the world during Noah's time. So we have to take upon ourselves to make a change in that regard. It's a huge understanding. Okay, and we see Ham, his son, literally sexually abused his father. And from him, all the evil nations descended from Ham. We come from Shem, who is the holiest of the three sons of Noah. Ham is the, was the evil one, and that's where all evil descended from because it rooted from sexual impurity, from disgust, okay? So we all have to take upon ourselves something in that regard. How can you guard yourself more? The next lesson we learn is that Noah left the, the, the ark, right? And what's the first thing he did? 
he brought a sacrifice to Hashem. But what's the next thing he did? He immediately planted a vineyard to have grapes so he could get drunk. And he got so drunk to the extent that he got completely naked. What's the deeper understanding here? You see, Noah, when he was in the, in the ark for about a year, he was in complete isolation. When we were in quarantine, we were all going kind of crazy. Now imagine Noah. And when he got out of the ark, he saw this entirely desolate world. All the people he ever knew, all the infrastructure he ever knew, everything was completely destroyed and completely blotted out of existence. Noah fell into this very deep depression of what had happened. So much so that he looked to God and he said, Hashem, how could you do this? Why did you do this? You destroyed everything. How are you capable of this? Noah couldn't understand how Hashem could do such a thing. He literally destroyed everything. And Noah felt very depressed. And so he brought a sacrifice to God because he's like, how is this possible? And then he makes a vineyard to be able to get drunk. What's the deeper lesson here? Noah felt into something that almost all of humanity does. And that's called victimization. Noah could not deal with his present reality. He did not want to face it. So he decided to escape from it. And he escaped from it with alcohol. You see, all of us are dealt a specific deck of cards in life. And most of us, instead of facing it head on and dealing with it and owning up to it and feeling the emotions and looking at what is presented to us in life and trying to see how we can take action from it, we victimize ourselves. And we say, why me? Why did you do this, God? And we fall into this depressive state and we try to escape from our lives. And every human has their own escape. Be it scrolling on your phone, be it alcohol, be it drugs, be it food. Everybody has their own escape. But it's a, it's a, it's a lie that we tell ourselves that we think that if we can escape our life, then everything will be better. But it won't. Look what happened to Noah. He thought that he could escape his reality of depression. And what ended up happening? He got so drunk that his own son turned on him, and then he ended up cursing his son and blessing his other sons. Do you think at the end of the day he wanted to actually curse his son? Not really. Nothing ended up well out of him escaping from his life. We cannot be victims. You see, Noah had two choices. He could have either seen the desolate world that Hashem had presented him with and say, Hashem, I don't understand this. This is actually very difficult. Everything I ever knew is gone. But you know what? If you gave this to me, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then you know that I am capable of going through this and, and building from this. I have the power to make something out of this. I have the power to build. I have the power to do and to create something better because you put me in this position. And if you gave me this lot in life, Hashem, then you know that I'm capable of overcoming it, of going through this. That was Noah's option number one. His second option, which is the option that he went for, which is always the easier option, is saying, I don't want to deal with this. This is too hard. This is too sad. He fell into a dark hole and he, he wanted to not deal with his life. So he escaped from it. So I look to all of you and all of us have something in our lives that we don't want to deal with and we try to escape from it, but it doesn't get us anywhere. We have to face our feelings and face our life and realize that if God gave us this lot in life, then we have the power to persevere and to go through this. That we have the power to uplift all of the energy in the lot that we have been given in life. And especially with what has happened in the past 10 days, most of us are trying to escape. We're trying to shy away from our feelings and shy away from our lives through social media, through all kinds of different physical addictions. But all it does is lead us into deeper depression and deeper anxiety and deeper worry. And it doesn't do anything to help us. So all of us have to choose to stop being victims to what's going on and be, be a man. Stand up. Pick yourself up. Rise. Don't be a victim. You know, there's one person who was the opposite of living in a victim mentality. And that was Avram Avinu. He comes exactly 10 generations after Noah. 
Avram was not dealt an easy life whatsoever at all. He was born in a society that was idolatrous, that was immoral. When he believed in the one God, he believed in morality. His own father turned against him. He was put into a fire. And Avram, instead of whining and crying about it, he went full on into the fire and said, if God is putting me in this fire, then he knows I have the strength to go through it. And he was put in a fire by the evil people of his generation because the evil people couldn't tolerate that Avram was standing for morality and one God. And they couldn't tolerate it. So they put him in a fire so he could burn alive. And Avram was thrown in that fire. And instead of complaining, he's like, God, if you're putting me here, I have the power to get through this. And he was put in that fire and the fire would burn, but Avram would not burn with it. And everybody was shocked. How is that happening? He's not burning. He's totally fine. And he left that fire and he was good as new. Avram was not a victim. In life, we have two options. Are we going to choose to be an Avram? Or are we going to choose to be a Noah? Are we going to be a victim to the situation that God gives us in life? Are we going to own up to it? Realize that God knows exactly what he's given to us. And he never gives you a battle that he knows you don't have the strength to overcome. He gives you the strength. You're just choosing to escape from your power. You have so much light and so much power to fight the darkness of this world. But you're allowing yourself to fall into this dark hole that the Yetzir Hara wants you to fall into. My message is don't listen to it. Don't be a victim to your life. Be an Avram. Rise. Huge lesson if we truly take it to heart. Stop scrolling. Stop hiding. Live your life empowered. And stop complaining. And stop asking God why. You're not going to get an answer. So when ask yourself why, ask yourself what you can do about it. What can you do with the situation that God has given you? No victims. Another thing about Avram and, and Noah, a little comparison, is that Noah was told, Hashem gave him 120 years. He told him, Noah, in 120 years, I'm going to destroy the world. And Noah's reaction was like, okay. He didn't really do much about it. Those 120 years passed, and the entire world was taken out. All of humanity, all of life. And after everything was gone, Noah said, Hashem, why did you do this? And he brought a sacrifice to God to attain mercy. You see, Noah was told by God that God was going to destroy the world. And Noah did nothing to stand up for his fellow human. He was like, if I'm going to be saved, then it's fine. If my family's going to be fine, it's fine. Avram, on the other hand, was the complete opposite. When he was told that Sodom and Gomorrah were going to be destroyed, he said, Hashem, let me find one righteous person. Please don't destroy them. And he went and he got Lot out of where he was. Avram was the type of person where if it is cold, he made a fire so that everybody could be warm. Noah was the kind of person where if you were cold, he just got himself a coat so that he could warm up. And that's the difference. That's why we come from Avram. We are the Jewish people where we think about others. We spread this light to other people. We don't just think about ourselves. We ask, how can we be of help to other people? How can we save others? How can we be of service to others? It's not just all about me. So now I wanna go into something deep, which is the reincarnations of Noah's soul. And, I, and this is from an old lecture of Rabbanit Kineret Sarah Cohen. It's very fascinating. So this parsha starts off with saying, Ele toldot Noach, Noach ish tzadik tamim. These are the generations of Noach. Noach was a righteous and perfect whole man. Okay, so that's the basic level of understanding this verse. Now, in the soul world, there's what's called the avot, the father souls, which are like the 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 main soul and then there's the toldot which is the generation which is like the offshoots which is kind of like the offspring of that one main soul so toldot could mean ele toldot noach these are the offshoots of noach's soul 
אלה תולדות נוח. נוח איש צדיק. Who is it telling us that is the first reincarnation of Noach so? Who is known as a tzaddik in the Torah? Yosef a tzaddik. We're told by Rechachamim that one of the reincarnations of Noach was Yosef a tzaddik. And I'm not going to get into that one that much. I'll get into the next one, but that's very interesting. And it says tamim, which is perfect. This is referring to Moshe Rabbeinu. Rechachamim tell us that Noach is a reincarnation of Moshe Rabbeinu. And we're going to go in and we're going to see the connection between both of their lives and how Moshe completed an entire rectification for all of the wrongs that Noah committed in his life. It's very fascinating. So, first of all, you have to understand that when we speak about the soul, the soul doesn't live within the confines of space and time. We live in a world that is confined by space and time, and that's why trying to grasp something that is not confined by space and time is beyond our imagination and beyond our understanding. But we have to try to think outside of the box and learn to understand that we're never truly going to understand because our minds are limited. So the soul is not confined by space and time. So when I say that this is a reincarnation of Noah's soul, it's not the entire soul of Noah, but it's a part of Noah's soul being reincarnated in Moshe Rabbeinu. So how do we see the correlation? Like I said, Noah, Hashem told him, you have 120 years, then I'm destroying the world. Noah didn't get people to change. He didn't rebuke people. He failed to tell people, hey, God's going to destroy the world because of your evil actions, because of your immorality, because of your robbery and your corruption. You have to change yourselves if you want to save yourself. And Noah failed to tell people anything. He failed to rebuke people. Noah also failed to plead to God, Hashem, please have mercy on humanity. Don't destroy them. No, instead, Noah, because it was him being saved and his family being saved, he was like, okay, it's fine. He also never imagined what would happen to the extent it would happen. And when Noah got off of the ark, the first thing he did was bring a sacrifice. And he said, Hashem, why did you do this? And Hashem looked to Noah and he said, Noah, I gave you 120 years. And only now, after all this happened, you look to me and you ask me why. And only now you bring me a sacrifice. I gave you 120 years to build that ark because I wanted you to ask me why before. I wanted you to plead the case for humanity before, but you failed to do so. I wanted you to bring a sacrifice to me before so I could have mercy on humanity, but you failed to do so. Don't ask me why now. You should have asked me why before. You should have talked to others before, but you kept your mouth shut. That is a big failing that we all do. We stay silent in times where we need to speak. Understand that everything we're learning about Noah is what we learn about ourselves. And every character in the Torah, we have a piece of them inside of us. We learn about them, we learn about us. So... Moshe, he's the leader of the Jewish people, right? And the sin of the golden calf happens. The Jewish people sin with the golden calf. And what happens? Hashem is very upset with the Jewish people. And he looks to Moshe and he tells Moshe, Moshe, I want to destroy them, all of them, again. I want to destroy all of them and start again with you, Moshe. Sounds familiar, right? Same thing happened with Noah. Hashem looks to Moshe and he says, Moshe, I want to start again with you. I'm going to erase them all. But Moshe looks to Hashem and he tells Hashem, Hashem, you erase them, you erase me. There is no me without them. I don't want any part in your book, in your Torah, that you made me write if they are not a part of it. Moshe completely changed his response this time he stood up for the rest he said no they're not i don't want any part of this if they are not going to be a part of this specifically in the torah moshe says macheni which means erase me when god looks to moshe and he says moshe i'm going to blot them all out and i'm going to start again with you and moshe tells him 
take them out and take me out. I don't want a part of it if they're not going to be in included. And he says, Mecheni, erase me, erase me from this book. Moshe knew exactly what word he was using when he said, Mecheni, erase me. When you switch around the letters in Mecheni, erase me, it is my Noach, the waters of Noach. You see the same, it's the same letters just flipped around. Moshe said, Mecheni, erase me. Same letters, my Noach, the waters of Noach. Moshe Rabbeinu was rectifying for his past life where he failed to step up for the rest of humanity. This time he understood his lesson and he said, this time it's, it's, it's them and it's me. But it's not just me. You're not just saving me this time. Huge understanding here. I hope you understood it. <laughs> so... And nothing's by coincidence in the Torah. If Moshe says Macheni, he knows what he's saying. My Noach, the waters of Noach. Now Moshe, if you recall, when he was a baby, he was also put inside of an ark, right? He was also put inside of a basket. You could call it an ark. He was put inside of a mini ark of a basket. He was put inside of the water and he was saved from the waters because of the ark that was built for him. When you have a reincarnation many times, your, your past life is very similar to your current life because it's almost a similar rectifications that you have to make. So it's very similar life, you understand? So that's why Moshe's past life was kind of repeating itself in different form. So he was put inside of a mini ark inside of the water. And what happens? He flows and he flows. And suddenly Batya, Paro's daughter, sees a little basket, a wicker basket, and he sees the little baby voice crying. And she reaches out his she reaches out her hand for the basket and she brings in the basket and she sees the little baby. And Batya was a very special woman. She was a convert to Judaism and she had prophecy. And when she saw this little baby, she was able to see his soul rectification that he needed to make in this life. And so she named him accordingly. Because as we know in Judaism, your name is not by coincidence. Your name is given to you exactly according to your purpose in life. When your parents give you your name, they have a moment of unconscious prophecy. They know exactly what name they're giving to you because that is your purpose in life. That is the root of your soul. Batya had prophecy and she was able to see Moshe's rectification that he needed to make. So what did she name him? She named him Moshe. What does Moshe literally mean in Hebrew? It means saved from the water, drawn out of the water, which is the same thing that happened to Noah. You see, Batya looked to Moshe and she said, I'm giving you this name so that you could know your rectification in this life. You are here to rectify for what you did with in the, your life with Noach. Moshe saved from water. So you could remember your past life. So you could easily do your rectification here. And that way, when Moshe was, was tested again with the same exact situation, he was able to respond in the rectified way. Very deep. There's another thing. Right. So what did Noah essentially fail to do? He failed to speak. God gave him 120 years to rebuke other people or to at least plead mercy to God. He failed to use his mouth. He failed to use his speech. Moshe comes into the world. And what happens to him as a baby? Hot coals go in his mouth and he has a speech impediment for the rest of his life. Because he's rectifying for his past life where he failed to speak when he was called to speak. And that's why he had a speech impediment for his entire life. You see, the measurements that God gave to Noah to build the ark were 300 by 50 by 30. Those were the measurements for the ark that God gave to Noah. In Hebrew, the letters are numbers. So the numerical value of 300 is shin, 50 is nun, and 30 is lamed. 
when you flip around these letters, it gives you lashon. Lashon literally means like your tongue. It means speech. As Noah, for those 120 years as he was building the ark, Hashem was telling him, lashon, use your mouth, speak. He was embedding it within the measurements of the ark. He was giving Noah signals. Use your voice. Make a change. So I don't have to destroy the world. He didn't. So he had to come into the next life with a speech impediment. And another interesting thing is that the material that Hashem told Noah to make the ark with is chafarta. It's a gopher. Chafarta has this. It's very similar spelled in Hebrew to kapara, which is atonement. This was another message that Hashem was sending to Noah. You need to atone. You need to make a change. But Noah wasn't able to, to do so. And make no mistake about it that most of us make the mistake to do so as well. We fail to rebuke others when we see them doing something wrong because we're scared of what they're going to think about us. We're scared about what society is going to say about us. But we can't be scared. We cannot live in fear. We have to live it up. We have to be proud of the, our morals and what we stand for. Because you never know in your next life when you're going to be have the consequence for not having spoken. God gave you your mouth and the ability for speech for incredible potential. We cannot waste it. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to share that story or, or that very deep Kabbalah of the reincarnation of Noah is because you never know. You never know somebody's past life. You never know your own past life. Many of us are given a, a specific life and we say, Hashem, why did you give me this? I don't deserve this. I'm innocent. I'm, I don't deserve this. If there's something I don't like is the word innocent. No one's innocent. No one's innocent. Everybody has done some wrong in their life or in their past life. And you never know the rectification that you need to make for that specific wrong that you could have made, be it in this life or in many past lives that you have lived. And since we're very far into, into the timeline of creation, all of us have been in this world many times over. There are rarely any new souls coming into the world. We have all been in this world many times already. That's why we all have so much rectification to make, which is why there's so much suffering in the world, because we're all rectifying for our past. So when you see that somebody or yourself or, or somebody around you is going through a hardship, again, don't fall into this victim mentality. Realize, Hashem, if you're giving this to me, I know this is for my ultimate soul benefit. Ultimately, our life in this world is so temporary. Our physical existence is so fleeting. Our soul, that's what's eternal. And God is looking out for our soul. He wants us to rectify our souls. So there may be things that, are very harsh that many people go through, but you never know the soul rectification that you are accomplishing by going through that hardship. Babies who go through suffering, everybody says, how could a baby go through that? And you'll never know the reason. You'll never understand the reason, but make no mistake about it that Hashem knows exactly what he allows happen in the world. Everybody is doing their own rectification in this life. You just don't know. So we trust. And reincarnation is a big belief in Judaism, by the way. Um, keep going. Before the, the flood, the generation of Noah had it all. They were, they were the top of the top in, in sense of luxury and the life that they were living. God gave them everything because God's ultimate desire for man he wants to bestow only abundance and only goodness on man. But what happened? Humanity couldn't take all the abundance and they became corrupt. Because that's what happens when there's just too much. There's too much pleasure. There's too much luxury. Humanity falls into evil. And, and, and what they did, 
complete Hamas, complete violence, complete robbery, complete sexual immorality, because they got too comfortable, because God gave them everything. And we're told specifically in the Torah that after the flood, God made it so that there would be seasons now. There would be summer, there would be winter, there would be fall, and there would be spring. Because before the flood, there were no seasons. It was all spring all year long. It was complete luxury. It was complete bliss. But God said no more. There has to be some discomfort for people. Because if not, people don't, don't move. People don't change. People don't reflect. They're just comfortable in the lives that they're living. And what happened with Noah? He had 120 years to bring a sacrifice. But only when he saw that the world was desolate did he bring a sacrifice. And that's what happens to most of us in life. When life is good and everything is flowing and everything is great, we don't feel like we need to reflect on our lives and make a change. And we don't feel like we need to make a sacrifice to God. It's only when God is like, when God leaves us in desolate situations, in harsh situations that we're like, oh my gosh, I have to make a sacrifice because I need this to change, which is exactly what happened. Where we're too comfortable in our division, in our lack of unity amongst our people and in our, in our materialistic ways, God said, if you're not going to wake up on your own, I'm going to have to make you wake up. And look at how, how, how much unity there is amongst us now. How much sacrifices we're all making. Because it takes desolate situations for humanity to wake up, frankly. If we could wake up while everything's going great and everything's luxurious, then, then the desolate situations don't have to come upon us. But Noah only brought the sacrifice when the world was destroyed. And then the next lesson is that the what is this water? I hope everything is being understood. Um, so the waters were raging waters. They were very aggressive waters, we're told. And what does Hashem tell Noach to do? Make for yourself an ark, a teva in Hebrew, and you will be protected from these raging waters. Right now, we are surrounded by raging waters that is society. And God tells all, all of us, make for yourself a teva. Make for yourself an ark. Rav Levi of Berditchev, he says that teva can also mean word. So ark, teva, can also mean word in Hebrew. What is the ark that we are supposed to... Um, protect ourselves with from the flooding waters of the, word, of the world, the word, the word of Hashem, the word of tefillah, the word of prayer. You want to protect yourself from all the craziness of this world? Immerse in Torah. Make your, for yourself a bubble of Torah. Make for yourself a bubble of tefillah. Speak to Hashem. Use your word. But as long as, as, as we don't find find a safety in Hashem's Torah and living a life of Torah and and praying using our word reading the word then we're going to be taken with the crazy waters of this world so once Noah the whole thing happens and he's he's back Hashem looks at what he did and he says that he kind of regrets what he did he regrets destroying all of humanity and he tells noah i'm making a covenant with you and with all of humanity going forward but i'm never going to destroy the world again the way that i did and he says that the sign will be that i won't destroy the world again my covenant with you with humanity is the rainbow a keshet whenever you see a rainbow that is my sign that i'm not going to destroy the world now, we all love to see rainbows, but Kabbalistically, you shouldn't look at a rainbow for too long because re in re reality, when you look at a rainbow, what it really is, every time that you see a rainbow, is God telling humanity, in this moment, I want to destroy humanity again because you guys have gotten insanely corrupt, but I'm not going to because of the promise I made with Noah. I'm holding back my my what I want to unleash on you guys, and I'm having mercy. That is the sign of the rainbow. So every time that you actually see a rainbow, it is a time of self-reflection and asking yourself, God is showing us that he's actually being extremely merciful right now. 
He's not happy with her ways. That's why he's putting the rainbow. What do I need to change? Mercy is a uh, rainbow is a time of self-reflection. So uh, there's two coins to the rainbow. On one side, it's a sign of God showing us he's judging humanity, but he's choosing to have mercy on us. And the other side is that God is showing us his great mercy. That he's not destroying us because of our evil ways. So there's a blessing that we say when we see a rainbow. You should look it up anytime that you see a rainbow. And it's a time to self-reflect with yourself. And you're actually not allowed to look at the rainbow. Just like look at it. Because it says the Shrina, the divine feminine presence of God, is the rainbow. It dwells on the rainbow. It is complete mercy. So you're not allowed to just stare at it. You're, you have to kind of just look at it. And then that's it. Reflect on your ways. Ask yourself why God showed you this sign. And that's, I think, almost everything I wanted to share in regards to Parshat Noach. There's a couple more things, but I think I'm not going to put them on life. And I'm going to turn on comments. So there's a lot to learn with what happened, with what we learned. Number one is the Hamas thing. It is the the sexual immorality that we have to eradicate, that God hates. There's nothing God hates more than that. We have to take it out of our being. Ask yourself how you could take out all this sexual immorality from your life because it's coming on from many doorways with all the evil people sending it. Be it for, through your screen, be it through the books that you're reading, be it through so many different things. Guard your mind. Guard your eyes, guard your, guard your thoughts. Don't fall into sexual impurity. Guard yourself more. If you want to fight Hamas. And no adultery. It's frankly more prevalent than most people understand. And it's scary. <laughs> and the second one was don't be a victim. Too many people like to be victims and that's why the majority of society is depressed and swallowing in their misery because nobody wants to to have courage. Nobody wants to have strength because it's the easier route to be a victim. So don't be a victim. Stand strong. Know that God gives you what you were able to go through. And what else did we learn? <laughs> we learned about the reincarnations. Know that we don't know. You never know why somebody has dealt a specific lot in life. Don't question God. God knows exactly what he is doing for your soul. Say thank you to what he's giving to you. Because he knows what he's doing. What else did we learn? Shelter in the Torah. Shelter in the word. And yeah. We're in the... The thing is that the live ends after an hour, so I have like 10 more minutes. So maybe I could speak a little bit about this month that we're in. We're in the month of, of, of Cheshvan, of Scorpio. And, uh, oh, and we learned to not be comfortable. Don't be comfortable. Because the, si the society of the flood was given everything. And what happens when you have everything? Humanity just fails. That's why God doesn't give us everything, because we don't know what to do with it. You look at the rates, and it's not mostly poor people that are depressed. It is mostly rich people that are depressed. And I'm not saying that money is bad. But don't think that by having it all, you're a happy person. God knows exactly what he's giving to you and what he's holding back from you. Everything is a gift from him. And, okay, so we're in the month of Cheshvan, which is actually this month where the flood happened way back then during Noah's time. And the letter of this month, because every single one of the Hebrew months is controlled by a specific letter, is the letter Nun. Nun stands for Nefila, which means falling. Can I write this down? Nun is the letter that controls and that builds this month. 
It stands for Nefila, which means fallen. The planet that controls this month is Mars. Mars is a is a month is a is a planet of dinim, of judgments, of gura. The sign of this month is Scorpio, which no one likes a Scorpio. The animal it stings you in the back. The second letter that this month is also created with, because every month has two letters that is created with, is Dalit. And Dalit stands for Dalut, which is emptiness, it's poverty. All of these things that lead us to believe that this isn't the greatest month. But the truth is that, I don't know if you guys know Rav Shimon Bar Yochai, who wrote the Zohar, founder of Kabbalah. Somebody once came up to him and asked him, Rav Shimon Bar Yochai, what is the purpose of creation? Why are we all here at the end of the day? Why create all this evil if we're just going to sink into it? And Rav Shimon Bar Yochai answered him that the purpose for which we are all here is itkafia sitra achra. It is to subdue the other side, to subdue the evil within all of us. That is what God ultimately wants. God created every single one of us with the Yetzer Atov, a good side, and a Yetzer Ara, an evil inclination, an ego. Call it what you want. He, the, the mission that he gives all of us is to overcome it. And he gives each and every single one of us a specific personality with negative character traits so that we can each uniquely overcome those. That's why some of us are more prone to be jealous. Some of us are more prone to be tempted towards specific sins. Some of us are more tempted to luxury and, and I can't think of things right now, or greed, whatever it is, because God wants us to overcome those negative traits. So that's what Rav Shimon Bar Yochai told that person. That is the purpose of humanity and why God created the world. Itkafia sitra achra. Destroy the evil side. And the evil side is out there, but it's also in here. Destroy it. Annihilate it. So we look at this month, and it's noon, it's nefila, it's falling, it's dalid, it's dalut, it's poverty, it's the scorpion, it's Mars, which is filled with judgments and war. It's literally the energy of this month. It's chaotic. But look at what Shimon Bar Yochai says. This is the purpose of creation. For it all to be bad, so that you could overcome the bad. God obviously didn't create this world for it all to be good. God could have made a perfect world. He obviously did not want a perfect world. He purposefully made an imperfect world with imperfect people because that's what he wanted. He wanted us to overcome the evil. So that's why he lets it exist. So that's really the message. Don't be a victim. Don't fall into sexual impurity. <laughs> Understand that all is coming from Hashem and that you're here to overcome the negative and overcome the evil. So yeah. That is the Shi'ur, Baruch Hashem, Toda Hashem. And may all of you see much blessing. May all of you have much more strength and stay off of scrolling on social media. It really doesn't help you with anything. That's just going to bring you into a dark hole. Stop escaping your life. Live your blessed life that God has so graciously given to you. So yeah, I guess I'll leave the live on until the time is up. So yeah. Thank you all for joining. If you have any questions, I'd love to answer as best as I can, Baruch Hashem. Yes. Baruch Hashem. Oh, and of course, bring the sacrifice before it's too late. Noah was given 120 years to bring the sacrifice. But he didn't. He only brought it once the world was desolate. Thank you for all of your sweet words. Who, what do you learn from books to share? I really recommend listening to Rabbanit Kineret Sarah Cohen online. She is in, amazing. Really big mind of Torah. What does this mean? Make sure.
Oh, one more thing. The tribe of this month, I might make a video about this, is Menashe, right? Every single one of the months have a specific tribe. 12 months, 12 tribes, that's where it roots from. It's Menashe. Menashe, I don't know if I have enough time to say what I want to say about him, but Menashe was the older brother of Yosef, the older son of Yosef. Yosef had two sons. The first one was Menashe. The second one was Ephraim. And if we see the common theme in the entire Torah is what happens. There's two brothers. The younger one is the one who's blessed and favored. The older one is always put aside and not favored like it should be, like the natural order of things should be, where the older one should always be blessed and favored, and he should be first. But it always happens that the younger one is always blessed and favored more. Happens, Yosef also has these two sons. Menashe is the older one, Prime's the younger one. Yosef is taking his two sons to Yaakov, Yosef's father. Menashe and Ephraim's grandfather, so that Yaakov could bless both of them. And Yosef positions his sons so that Menashe is under Yo Yaakov's right hand, because your right hand is more powerful. And he positions Ephraim to be under Yaakov's left hand, because Ephraim is the younger one. And what does Yaakov do? He switches his hands so that his right hand may bless Ephraim, the younger one, and that his left hand may bless may bless. Menashe. Because Yaakov said, Ephraim needs to be the greater one. There's more potential in Ephraim. And Ephraim ends up being the more abundant, blessed one, even though he's the younger one. So the common story repeats itself. But if Menashe chooses to make a difference this time, instead of being jealous of his brother and upset with his brother, that even though he's the older one and he deserves the right to be blessed and favored, he's happy for his brother. He says, you know what? If Hashem gave you this, if Hashem wants you to be blessed, then I'm happy for you, my brother. I'll pray for you, and I love you. And that's the hardest lesson for most of humanity to learn. That life is not a competition between all of us. And we should be happy for each other's success, which is very difficult, 100%. Especially if God implanted within you an extra um, inkling towards jealousy. But let's learn to be like Menashe. Be happy for one another. So yeah. I love you all very much. And may you all see many blessings. May we see Mashiach and the Geula. And yeah. I don't know. Is this going to end by itself once an hour goes up? Am I still going to be able to save it? Or should I end it myself? Hello from Mexico. Hola. Veo que hay mucha gente de Sudamérica. Y me hace muy feliz. También me hace muy feliz recibir mensajes en español. I can save it without ending it myself. Like, is it going to end by itself? And then I can save it. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining. You're coming back often. Um, I gave the shiur this morning. I give, uh, I'm starting to give a partial shiur to a group of women every morning on, on Thursday mornings. So hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll try Thursday nights to give the shiur. So stay tuned for next Thursday. If any of you want to support and sponsor, email me. And it's a big help. Say beforehand. All right. Thank you all very much. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for all your comments and your messages and your 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 sweetness. May you all be very, very blessed. All the best to all of you.
ברוך השם. Oh, and on YouTube. Hello everybody from YouTube. You watched this far. <laughs> Let me know if you watched till the very end right now. Comment down below. 